a fear monger, fear based, spiritually retarded, vibrationally challenged, whatever the euphemism may be, right? And see, that, that is very invalidating and it's very disrespectful of the people that have had the experiences. And what's interesting also was, often as not, when I come across people who claim to only have had positive experiences with, with good aliens, again, when these subjects come up, they get agitated, they reach for, <coughs> reach for a cigarette, they start whinging about how the information that myself and or my colleagues share is so negative and fear-based. But my goal is to provide validation to those having the negative experiences, to provide a conceptual framework so they can understand the nature of their experiences and the methodologies utilized by the negative ETs to essentially program them and use them in, in a variety of ways which completely undermines their personal sovereignty and dignity. So that much being said, uh, let, let us start. Now, this is an important case, and I won't go into the, the whole psychodrama of, of how the, the eyewitness of, of this case, Fiona Hardigan, had her life basically destroyed by the local debunkers here in Sydney. Fiona Hardigan uh, made the mistake of, of, of contacting the, of the, the major media here in, in Sydney and shared with them some photographs she'd taken on her way home from work. She was coming home uh, around dusk in Chipping Norton and she felt that it was such a beautiful sunset that she ought to pull over and take a series of pictures and she did. She pulled over to the side of the road to the shoulder got out of her car and took a series of photographs. Lo and behold what she saw during the uh, the experience of taking the photos and what showed up in the imagery later was far more than just the sunset and it's important that I emphasize this case because it, it dovetails perfectly with some of the, the, the cases and the, and, and the types of research that I do and my colleagues do. What you're looking at is an actual wormhole, an actual stargate which appeared above the tree canopy uh, on, on the stretch of road, a little further down is a bridge a stargate appeared up in the upper right. You see that searing light. Now the local debunkers try to say that was a lamplight. That's just asinine. Uh, and, and moreover, I stood beneath that tree. There is no bloody lamplight there. I personally investigated this case. I spent over 12 hours speaking with Fiona Hardigan. I debriefed her thoroughly. What happened was the stargate opened up and then a number of these metallic spherical craft flew out of it. And at one point, two craft flew out of it after some others, and one craft flew off in one direction, and another craft flew off in another. There is a researcher in the UK who did the analysis of this series of pictures, and he determined that this was indeed a traversable, i.e. moving wormhole, because based on the series of pictures, the location of the, uh, the wormhole directly above the canopy, and then its location at the end uh, of the sequence of pictures, it had moved before it blinked out. Now this is an extremely important case. I understand the value of, of, of imagery like you've been seeing uh, before I got here. Uh, I understand the value of, of, of UFO reports, so on and so forth, but I am really interested in the hardcore information where the rubber meets the road, which is why I'm particularly interested in the encounter experiences that people have with, with ETs and other non-human beings, sometimes subterrestrial beings. Now this is not a run-of-the-mill UFO uh, sighting. This is an, an actual example of craft flying out of an active wormhole. Now it's purely conjectural on my part, but I would suggest that the other side of that wormhole may be at or uh, very close to uh, a, perhaps the sun or a star because it, it, it's well known in esoteric lore that stars are actually stargates and in some of the subsequent sl uh, slides I'll show you you will get an example of that. And here's a close-up. Again, that, that's not a lamplight. That is uh, a, a searing light that's coming out of an opening and you see that 
metallic object right there. Now the debunkers said, it's characteristic of, of debunkers that they routinely misrepresent, mischaracterize, and outright, outright lie about the testimony of the, of the eyewitnesses. In this case, they switched it all around and said, well, she didn't get out of her car and took the photos like she said. She, that craft you see in the center of the picture, that's a sultana, the debunkers said. To any Americans in the audience, that's a raisin, okay? Uh, yes, they said that's a sultana, and basically she was lying. Long story short, uh, and I won't elaborate or, uh, on it, but this case highlights all that is good and all that is bad about mainstream ufology. This witness, Fiona Hardigan, had her life destroyed by this particular debunker and his accomplices. I, I call, I'll call him Lens Flare and his merry band of Flareans. What happened was they, they trolled her, her, her Facebook page. They came up with 76 pages thereabouts of, of venomous abuse that they meted out to her on Above Top Secret. And those same trolls at Above Top Secret fluttered onto her Facebook page. They also uh, fluttered onto the comment section of the, the major newspaper in which uh, this story was featured. To the point that Fiona's children began to be bullied at school. Fiona's health suffered radically. She, at one point it was touch and go whether she would survive and it almost destroyed her marriage. Now, I, I would encourage people when they have these kinds of exper uh, experiences and these sightings to leave the lamestream co corporate media out of the equation. We don't need them. We have the internet. We have social media. We don't need to go hat in hand, oh please, please, look at, look at the great work we've done. They've been a fundamental part of keeping a lid on, on the story and ridiculing and mocking witnesses for decades, since at least 1953 when the CIA started this comprehensive debunking and ridiculing program utilizing paid academics and utilizing the corporate media. Traversable wormholes, keep this point in mind. And there's a couple of more photos, close-ups. I mean, this, I've personally investigated a number of cases. I've walked the ground. This is one of the, the outstanding cases I've ever, I've ever investigated. I must say that it's not any surprise to any of you, but you happen to live in a mega UFO hotspot. Now, where I come from, the southwestern desert uh, of, of the U.S., San Diego, California, places like that, unless we knew someone who was having frequent experiences within you know, the nearby locale, we had to drive hours out into the desert, out into some remote mountaintop somewhere, to get this kind of activity. And I must say, this kind of activity, because natural, there are natural occurring stargates and artificially uh, generated portals and stargates all over the planet. Indeed, uh, the Aborigines, the Native American elders, so on and so forth, they utilize the worldwide grid of, of portals to get around. This is why Aboriginal skeletons are found in North America, South America, all over the place. So we no longer need to go hand in hand to the corporate media and try to seek their approval. We can bypass them. This is an outstanding case. And a close up. That is my late great mentor, Barbara Bartholik. I was a protege of hers. Her first and foremost protege was Dr. Carla Turner, candy to her friends. And uh, Barbara was my spiritual mama. She did 30 years of alien abduction research, regressed countless alien abductees, knew the ins and outs of, of the alien abduction internal dynamics. And I was blessed to have her as a mentor and a teacher in this life. She passed over uh, to the other side of the veil uh, a couple of years back. Uh, out of the Barbara Bartholik uh, researcher tree, if you will. Next after her came Dr. Carla Turner. She passed away in, in, in January. Uh, well, I, I gave a memorial speech on Candy Turner's behalf in, in Philadelphia in, in 97, January 97. She passed away shortly before that, of course. 
But Dr. Carla Turner inspired me, and she inspired a lot of other people because Dr. Carla Turner did not shrink from the hardcore information. Okay. I want people to start thinking about an expanded arena. This is what is going on. Now, some of you are familiar with this image. I'll show you a close-up. Uh, Jaime Masson was, uh, is, in fact, is the presenter of Mexico's version of 60 Minutes. It's called 60 Minutos or something over there. Now, he did a segment of this on his show. Now, this is mainstream uh, media in Mexico. Think about this. This spherical object parked in front, right in front of the sun for 80 hours, and it seemed to gas up from the plasma of the sun. And those of you that are familiar with uh, Wild Thornhill's work and, and others, the el plasma electric model of the universe is the correct model of the universe, uh, of, of stellar formation, galactic formation, et cetera, et cetera. I have no patience with lamestream uh, scientists who constantly invoke the bogus science. They can't even get basic concepts like stellar formation correct or basic concepts like, like what are comets. For example, when Comet Ison passed by Mars, it sparked Mars up. Mars turned green for a while. Dirty ice balls shouldn't be able to do that. That's why suddenly, you know, on, on that particular day, NASA and other federal agencies uh, were sent packing because there was no money in the till to, to run operations for that particular day when Ison was passing Mars. Incidentally, what's interesting too, if you find a book out there called uh, Phoenix Rising, uh, the, the visions of, of the future earth changes by Nowise. Nowise was a uh, Native American uh, uh, Chippewa shamanist. She said there's going to be come a point in time, and she described a whole bunch of other earth changes, sinkholes, et cetera, et cetera. She said there's going to come a point in time when our atmosphere will turn green. Now, isn't it interesting that Mars' atmosphere turned green in a plasma electric interaction with, with Ison as it passed? Anyhow, back to the frame. We can see that that sphere, which is several times larger than this planet, is drawing this plasma energy from the sun. It did this for about 80 hours, and then it flew away. And this is just one of many examples. This imagery was, was from the SOHO uh, uh, observatory. Here is another very large craft, Saturn-shaped. Again, an expanded arena. We have to th start thinking big. We've got to start thinking in galactic cosmic scales. The debunkers of the world want to keep this at arm's length. They want to keep it at a, at a lights in the sky level. Because lights in the sky ultimately are, are, are uh, transient events, will o' the wisp, maybe some to it, maybe, uh, maybe not. Really can't stick your teeth into it. This, that is very interesting if you ask me. Okay. And here's the incoming fleet. Now, what I'd like to do is show, show a quick video, uh, if you don't mind, Paul, uh, hitting that. Some of you have already seen this. There's an outfit in, in, in the UK called the Alien Disclosure, Disclosure Group. And uh, get a load of this. Again, we're talking star, uh, stargates and portals. It seems obvious to me that there is, in Stargate SG-1 terms, an event horizon that the camera is getting, is imaging side on, because the craft that begin to manifest seem to be exiting stage right from our perspective. You can see, it, it's like there's a cutoff point there where they just seem to be coming out. We don't see any here. It's possible that they're, they're, they're teleporting and they're manifesting right there. My intuitive uh, feel about this is that they are exiting a, a large stargate somewhere within our solar system. I believe that that imagery was taken by the International Space Station, but don't, but don't um, quote me on that. And I must give credit to all the people online. The, the people in, in, in the Alien Disclosure Group and others like them who, who spend thousands of uh, man hours and woman hours scanning all this space imagery, looking for anomalies like this. 
for example, another very good site you can find online is uh, the Mars Anomalies Research website by Joseph P. Skippers. All kinds of anomalies on the Mars, uh, on the surface of Mars. Nowadays, whenever the Curiosity images something, the, the standard pat excuse is, it's a rock that looks like a skull. It's a rock that looks like a lizard. It's a rock that looks like a squirrel, right? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Again, an expanded arena. Let's think big. Let's think beyond the solar system. Because many of you people here, whether you realize it or not, and you're starting to catch on, at least some of you, some of you already know, you've been involved in this subject, this celestial cosmic uh, actual uh, confrontation against the Draco reptilian overlords for many lifetimes. Some of you had lifetimes long before you came to Earth uh, and started incarnating as Terrans. Okay, here's another thing that must be taken into account. Our planet has been subjected to celestially driven cataclysms over time. The last time this solar system, not just this planet, but this solar system was really hammered was 12,500 years ago, give or take a couple of thousand years. And I believe that it was a series of events. It was the galactic superwave event described by Dr. Paul Laviolette, essentially a tremendous energetic burst from center of the, the galactic core, uh, which come into the solar system. They, they, they push in the cosmic dust from beyond the solar system, which results in the heavens and the sun and the, uh, the moon being blotted out, so on and so forth. The sun starts cooking off all the, the, the cosmic dust and then fire literally rains down from the heavens, melts the, the, the poles causing tsunami, uh, 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 glacial tsunami, so on and so forth. And then at the tail end of that, I do believe a rather large comet or comets came through the solar system. And the end result was probably a pole shift, crustal displacement, something along those lines. Now, what comes around sooner than this galactic superwave event and the return of these very large planet-sized comets is this sister solar system. Call it Nibiru, call it Wormwood, Her Herculobus. I've been tracking this for a long time now, and I happen to be plugged into a network of outstanding uh, Planet X researchers. Now, this is just an example. It's there's some call that. Uh, body in the middle, a brown dwarf, and uh, it seems to have its own solar system around it. And according to some sources, there may be a, a, as many as 10 bodies uh, surrounding that central sun. And everything is based on scale. I mean, that may look like a so-called br brown dwarf vis-a-vis -vis our star, but remember, our star looks like a marble compared to Betelgeuse. Okay, everything, again, scale, uh, so on and so forth. Here, here's a, here's a close-up. Now, my intuitive feeling, I know some of you have had these too. Some of you have had recurring dreams of tsunamis, of floods, of uh, fireballs, of uh, earth changes of all kinds, uh, civil unrest, which results from all the, all the earth changes. Well, the fact of the matter is, these celestially driven cataclysms have seared themselves into our collective unconsciousness. They've seared themselves into our very DNA. And we, our own planet is, is ample proof that we have endured, we being this planet, tremendous geological upheavals. Uh, and remember, 12,500 years ago, thereabouts, in terms of geological time, that was last week. And we're on the cusp of these again. Now, all of these futuristic visions that people have had, myself included, they remain probabilities. Probabilities in a multi multiverse of probabilities. It doesn't mean they have to happen. I am of the opinion that we have had some help from positive beings that have somewhat slowed or mitigated the, uh, the consequences of these incoming celestial bodies, including comets. I, I can't help but feel that things could have gotten a lot, lot worse and spiraled out of control by now, but that's just my take on it. Okay, now we're getting to the MyLab part of it. 
one of the most important cases of all time is the Roswell case, and I won't, I won't go on o over that for too long. Suffice to say that Roswell is the case that makes the case. There are at least 100 first and second hand eyewitnesses to the crash retrieval of more than one craft, and there were not only eyewitnesses in New Mexico, but in the other military bases where some of the wreckage, some of the technology, and the bodies, living and dead, were taken to. So it must be understood that when one civilization acquires technology, weaponry, whatever the case may be, from another uh, civilization, they almost invariably incorporate said technology. To give just a few examples from history, when the Romans first went to the Iberian Peninsula, they came across the fierce Celtiberian mountain tribes. The Celtiberian mountain tribes had a short sword. The Romans adopted that short sword. It became known in, throughout history as the gladius, the Celtiberian, Celtiberian gladius. When you see the, the logo, the, the special air service, people say, oh, that's a winged dagger. No, that's the Roman gladius sword. It's a weapon of empire. When the Germans found a nearly intact Russian T-34 in the northern sector, Army Group North area near Leningrad, the T-34 had a wide chassis, sloped frontal, frontal armor, uh, a, a large caliber cannon. German engineers got to work and created their response to the T-34, which we know was the uh, Kampfwagen Mark V Panther. When the Japanese left the plane in the Aleutian Islands, a nearly intact Mitsubishi Zero, when the uh, Americans invaded uh, the uh, Aleutian Islands, they found this nearly intact Japanese Mitsubishi Zero on the ground. They brought it back to my old stomping grounds, what's now known as Naval Air Station North Island, what used to be known as Rockwell Field. They had American test pilots have a go with it, uh, flying around the Mitsubishi Zero. And out of that, Grumman uh, Aircraft built the Grumman F6F Hellcat as a means to counter the Japanese Mitsubishi Zero. We have the same thing here. Because some of these researchers, despite their best efforts, they won't debunk Roswell. And Roswell was a tip of the iceberg. Aztec, New Mexico, March 1948. Kingman, Arizona, 1953, so on and so forth. There was numerous crash retrievals. He is a very important witness. This is, I'm sure some of you heard the story. The late Ben Rich was the director of the Skunk Works, uh, which is Lockheed's Advanced Development uh, Programs Division. He was a protege himself of Kelly Johnson, uh, the, the founder of, of the Skunk Works. And uh, it was under Kelly Johnson and Ben Rich's supervision that the U-2, the, the uh, Aurora and a number of other spy planes and now hypersonic craft have been developed. Ben Rich, prior to his death, gave a what amounts to a deathbed confession to, I believe his name was Tom Kelleher, who was a MUFON consultant with an aerospace background. And Tom Kelleher interviewed Ben Rich. And the outcome of the interview was the following. Ben Rich admitted, yes, there are real alien UFOs and there are man-made UFOs. He admitted that it will not take centuries or a lifetime <clears throat> to travel to other star systems. He said, this is a very interesting statement, he said, we found an error in the equations. We found an error in the equations. We made the correction and now uh, the military traveled the stars. Now, what are the equations? I mean, my guess would be probably Einstein's famous equation, right? Just bear with me as I, as I get a trick of water here. <coughs> Thanks. Ah, oh, thank you. He said, we have small fleets of, of craft based on alien technology, which we've recovered, and also, which he didn't come out and say, but there has been this ongoing interaction between non-human 
life forms and deep black elements of the military aerospace community, which I will talk about shortly. This is just a lead up, a lead up to all that. So he also said something that was very interesting, which is absolutely connected with all of this. He said he was, uh, he was asked how the, uh, the, the propulsion or navigation worked. And Ben Rich said to Tom Kelleher, he said, I've got a question for you. Uh, how, does, how does ESP work? And then Tom Kelleher of Memory Serves said something that affect that all time and space is one. Ben Rich replied, exactly, that's how it's done. You see, inside the craft, these beings they have this symbiotic link with their technology. Some of the technology is extremely advanced, as you know, and it responds instantaneously to the, com the mental commands of, the, of, of the, the entities. If they want to create a portal or a hatch here, a hatch manifest, it's what's been described as organic technology. Organic technology, some of the really advanced beings, their technology is crystalline. He said we have small fleets of these craft that we've developed based on ET uh, technology. I, I would beg to differ. I would say there are large fleets of them now. And he said the military has been traveling the stars. So keep all that in mind. This is why they worked so hard to debunk Roswell, right? Because Roswell and other similar crash retrievals and then later the, the in ongoing interaction with uh, non-human life forms it created what Richard Dolan referred to as a breakaway civilization. Now that is a very apt way of describing this because the people in uh, the engineers and scientists in this, these types of deep black programs would have a radically different understanding of metallurgy, chemistry, uh, physics, uh, cosmology, just how the universe came to be and so on and so forth. The breakaway civilization really is a breakaway civilization. And I'll, I'll talk more about this as time goes on. Okay, next slide. Bob Lazar, very important uh, eyewitness. He was, many of you are familiar with his story. I won't go into it in too much detail. That to his left is Gary Schultz, uh, a researcher. He was a physicist who worked on alien propulsion systems, particularly Zeta Gray propulsion systems in S4, and he worked for the Office of Naval Intelligence. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the Office of Naval Intelligence is. The Office of Naval Intelligence is a special agency within Naval Intelligence which specializes, at least the official overt reason for existence of ONI is uh, exploiting technology, the developing technological systems, uh, and going worldwide and finding all different types of technology which they have not yet acquired, acquiring it somehow and then developing either uh, copies of it or effective countermeasures, so on and so forth. So ONI is a branch of naval intelligence. They're not one and the same. And I believe his story implicitly and I believe like a lot of people he's held back. Uh, because according to John Lear, who know, knew him very well, Lazar was very familiar with, with the operations going on on Mars and elsewhere, and, which is a commonality that, that people uh, with my lab experiences describe. Many of them recall being taken to Mars and, and other places. Uh, that's yours truly in the middle there, mugging for the camera. Uh, the, the gentleman on the right has since passed away. That is uh, Bill Uhouse, a former uh, aerospace engineer who worked with an alien scientist named J-Rod. It was this race of gray-looking beings at S4. He and his team were working on developing a navigation simulator based on the craft that had crash-landed in my old stomping grounds of Kingman, Arizona. And to show you the nature of the compartmentalization and need to know, it was three years before most of the members of his team even realized what they were working on. And he said that uh, he worked alongside alien scientists. This particular group of ETs was called the J-Rods. And uh, this is very common in these deep black weird science projects. They give aliens names that we would 
be able to pronounce, like Joe or Steve or something, because some of these ET names are literally unpronounceable. Interesting, he also said that Dr. Henry, uh, Dr. Uh, the guy that was Oppenheimer's rival, uh, also used to show up a lot at S4 over, over time. The guy that actually hired uh, Bob Lazar, his name will come to me, it? claims to be the, the discoverer and, and the developer of, of the hydrogen bomb, but actually he stole the idea from, from someone else. Okay, now we're getting to the MyLab stuff. This is Dan Sherman. This is one of the most important cases that have come out in recent years. But strangely enough, it really hasn't gotten much mileage within the UFO community. Dan Sherman, for all intents and purposes, was a MyLab. He, for all intents and purposes, he was born into this deep black uh, program where deep black elements of the military, aerospace, medical community interact on a routine basis with non-human life forms. In this case, the group he was involved with, he was a member of the Air Force Security Service, which is now known as the Air Force Electronic Security Command, which is the National Security Agency's Air Force subsidiary. So let's just call it Air Force Security Service. His mother was an alien abductee, he was an alien abductee. In a very early age, he was guided, groomed, and eventually shunted into this program. And what this program was, he describes it as a gray project. He was told that the name of the project was Project Preserve Destiny. And he was told by his superiors that there will come a point in time, very interesting to see how it ties in with the selectively driven cataclysms, futuristic visions of, of disaster. He was told by his superiors in Air Force Security Service that there will come a point in time when the grid will go down and communications and, and basic life as we know it will, will cease to exist. However, he was told, we will still need to maintain comms with a particular race of ETs. So he was essentially part of a genetics program where the, where the Zeta Grays, again, were genetically manipulating him and his mother to ensure that he had uh, telepathic abilities which would make him a valuable part of this future program, Project Preserve Destiny. In a nutshell, he had to sit there and look at a monitor. He'd hear a tone in headphones, and he'd have, he'd have to simulate the tone in his mind and, and make these wavy lines on the screen flatline and go straight. And that was, he, this took a long time for him to master, and then he was ready for the telepathic communication with the ETs. And the telepathic communication was always the same. It was a long number, a serial number designation followed by coordinates. A long serial number designation followed by coordinates. He realized over time that the long serial designation was an identifier of a particular alien abductee. And the coordinates, latitude and longitude, was where the aliens abducted that person, where they put him back. I would suggest that at least a significant percentage of those people in that, uh, that were described, uh, identified by this serial number, at least some of those people were my labs. Now, l this brings me up to the whole my lab issue. L let me tell you what my labs are, my definition of my labs. My labs are legitimate alien abductees who also, on occasion, are kidnapped, trained, mind controlled, and utilized as an operational asset by deep black elements of the military aerospace community, oftentimes in conjunction with aliens. And some of the aliens, unfortunately, are of the negative variety, the abducting variety, the reptilians. And I must stress that there are a number of these programs. They seem to be running in parallel. There may or may not be an umbrella organization that coordinates the activities of all these different factions. Some people report uh, encounters with Air Force personnel. Others report encounters with Naval personnel. Others report encounters with Army personnel. It varies. Sometimes it's dependent upon the proximity of a given branch of the service and surface level bases. Like someone, like in Southern California, for example, many my labs have been taken to 
the underground facility at, at, at Edwards Air Force Base. And likewise, some my labs have been taken underground beneath the Naval Weapons Center, China Lake. And sometimes, like what used to happen to a friend of mine, Diane Johnson, one week the Air Force would grab her and bring her to an underground base beneath Georgia Air Force Base. And on another occasion, the next week, the Navy would come around and take her to an underground base at China Lake. So it, it varied. Now, what's important to understand are we are the sum of all our parts. And what differentiates a, a my labs from the general population is that my labs tend to have the DNA of not just one ET race, often in, as times a number of ET races. Some positive, some not so positive. Within this alien DNA is contained latent metaphysical powers. Now, when abductees are in an alien environment, whether it's an installation, a base, a UFO, what have you, sometimes the, the, uh, the abductee will, will manifest metaphysical powers. They can interface with alien technology. They can telepathically speak to the, uh, the ETs on board or uh, even other abductees. They can levitate. They can, they can manifest telekinesis. They can emit energy from their, their hands and, and so on and so forth. Now, all these are, are skill sets which are desi desired by the deep black military controllers. And again, we see a historical uh, aspect, a historical relationship to this. Uh, uh, the Carthaginians, uh, the, the old foes of the Romans in, in three different wars. They're, they're, they're cavalry, cavalry were the Numidians, the, uh, regarded as the best cavalry in the ancient world. Uh, the, the, the Romans themselves used the skills of a number of different tribes and, and uh, cultures, slingers, uh, archers, so on and so forth. And so this is what seems to be happening where the deep black elements of the military, they know that the DNA within a given my lab can, if properly exploited, properly activated and triggered, can manifest metaphysical abilities. And I'll go into more detail as time goes on, time permitting, because it's very common uh, for, for alien abductees to manifest abilities such as astral travel, remote viewing, spontaneous remote viewing. I've had countless precognitive dreams. All of those things and more will be utilized by deep black elements of the military in these ops. And these ops will take place in underground facilities, on, in remote areas of, of surface uh, facilities or remote areas of the surface, and including off-world ops. And I'll, and I'll get into more of that. Let me just review my notes here real quick so I don't get ahead of myself. Uh, let me check the time, too, because I don't want to. Oh, OK, 10 minutes, good. And bef yeah, in the final 10 minutes, I'll talk about a bit about what myself and, and our team in, in the high desert of Southern California first learned and contrast it with what we've since come to know about my lab operations. In the old days, what would happen, when I mean the old days, the late 80s, early 90s, this was a very common scenario. The, the military would show up sometimes during the day, especially if it was in the high desert areas of Southern California, these remote, dusty kind of towns uh, and, and, and medium-sized towns and small cities. The military would show up when the, uh, say, the husband w was at work, and they would show up in a, in a white van. And they would come right to the door, and they would have sometimes like a black box, very common item described uh, in, in the MyLab lore, a black box with wires coming out of it. And they would tweak these, uh, they would tweak some knobs or something on, on this black box, and they would render everybody, except the person that they were interested in, they would render them all unconscious, even the animals of the house, dogs and cats. And they would come in, say, 
how are you doing, Diane? It's time to go, right? And then they bring her out to the van, they drive away, and they eventually wind up in an underground base. Sometimes they, they, the military would show up in a helicopter if it, if it was a remote location, a uh, place in the countryside. And then they would force the person, sometimes at gunpoint, onto the helicopter and take them away. And there were different methods of coercion that were utilized. Uh, sometimes an aerosol can that emitted a citrusy kind of smell would render the Mylab unconscious and they would take her away. Sometimes they would jolt her, jolt her with what amounted to like electric prod, uh, a little handheld one that's been uh, created by a number of these security uh, corporations. And other times they would just manhandle uh, the guy or the gal and, and take them out to the vehicle or take them out to the helicopter. And what they would do when they got to the base was, was whether it was an uh, above ground base, uh, subsurface base, sometimes uh, a corporate office in a corporate building, an office building somewhere in town, which, which they r rented out as a front, they would at times harshly interrogate these people. And they would ask them what they remember of their alien abduction experiences. I've even known cases of my labs being debriefed and harshly interrogated about their past lives. A past life as, as a German in, in World War II, in one particular case. And, and the, the person that was being interrogated was a female, a female Mylab. Oftentimes, the military is asking about other types of aliens that the woman or the, or the man is involved with, because as above, so below. As I'll get later on in, in this presentation, what we're seeing here on this planet is merely the latest extension of ongoing cosmic wars that have gone on for countless millennia. The lore is rich about conflict going back to the Orion constellation, so on and so forth. I've even spoken to people that have past life memories of, of being an ET warrior in one, one faction or another, and there are alliances, there are federations, there are counter alliances, there are councils, that's all true. It sounds Star Wars-ish, it sounds Star Trek-y, but the fact of the matter is, and my friend Ray here later on that's, uh, after the lecture can tell you, that Gene Roddenberry got the idea for the Galactic Federation of Planets from actual contactees. And uh, just right before we leave, I must point out, because it dovetails with what, what I'm going to talk about in the second half. I could sympathize why David I sp spends 10 hours a day doing these lectures because there's so much information. It's not for a lack or a want of information. When you really delve into it, when you spend a lot of time talking to people, you just amass over time a, a, a massive database of information that people have really experienced. This is not conjectural. It's not speculative. These are real things that people really go through. And the last thing I'll leave you with before we go to break is, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, scientifically oriented, quote unquote, UFO researchers went out of their way to discredit, debunk, marginalize people who call themselves contactees. And typically the contactees describe having experiences with oftentimes human looking aliens. They don't look like us, we look like them in actual fact. And it would be uh, an amiable kind of encounter where they would be in, oftentimes invited onto the craft, taken for a ride. And, and sometimes these, uh, these contacts and interactions lasted for many years. Now, the scientifically oriented uh, researchers at a time, heavily influenced by National Investigations Committee of Aerial Phenomena, NICAP, which was basically taken over by intelligence after they ousted the, the founder of, of, of NICAP, major, retired Marine Major Donald Kehoe. NICAP wanted to keep everything at a, at a nuts and bolts, lights in the sky thing. Uh, let's focus on the crap and pictures and determine if a picture is a hoax or not. Never mind, forget about whoever is flying the crap. That's beside the point, right? So when these contactees start saying, well, I'm meeting them on a regular basis, they're taking me up into their ships, they're showing me things, they're talking about uh, their technology, their civilization, they were ridiculed uh, by the media, they were, de they were even debunked by the 
the mainstream UFO researchers. And again, the first line of defense for the control system is always the UFO community itself and all the gatekeepers and debunkers within it. Well now, fast forward to the present, it turns out that a lot of those contactees were not so crazy after all. Because to this day, throughout the world, people are still encount encountering and reporting encounters with beings who look perfectly human. And I underscore the word perfectly three times because they seem to have a mastery of genetics. They seem to have perfectly symmetrical features. Uh, they don't have any freckles. Uh, they don't have any moles. They don't have any kinds of imperfections, these human-looking beings. They can have blonde hair, dark hair, brown hair, so on and so forth, varying sizes, some relatively small or medium sized, some rather tall. But it turns out that many of the uh, revelations from within the deep black aerospace community, uh, whistleblowing and anonymous whistleblowing from aerospace engineers, scientists, what have you, as well as the uh, reports from people today having encounters with friendly human looking beings and other non looking human beings that are still friendly. It jibes in, all, in, many detail, in many ways with what the contactees talked about. So that's going to be a key element w when I pick up the story about MyLabs in the second half because the negative aliens want to know about what the good aliens are doing with these MyLabs. These MyLabs find themselves often as not caught in a cosmic tug of war between two or more factions. So enjoy your break and then I'm going to go and mellow out for for a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, James. They say that the, this particular advanced race of people down there uh, on the ocean floor, and they also have bases beneath the ocean floor, they want nothing to do with what's going on in the surface. Indeed, they have nothing but contempt for the people here on the surface for letting things degenerate to the state that they've degenerated. It's, it's a very common thing that I hear. Uh, so that's just one example of, of subsurface civilizations which deep black elements of the military, in this case naval intelligence, interacts with. Now, these MyLabs are trained based on the particular skill set they bring to the table and their psychological profile as well, which ties in 100% uh, with their, their DNA profile, if you will. Remember that psychology follows neurology, which follows genetics. The surface level criminal profilers would have us believe that all these serial murders, and I'll get into this more later with, with the reptilian part of the, the speech, that all these criminals, they're, they're just suffering from some kind of psychological aberration, right? That it's just some kind of psychological disorder. They have all these unresolved issues they haven't worked out, and they're just projecting their issues on the on the society. Well, it's, it's a lot deeper than that, but also it's a lot simpler than that. It has to do with their DNA profile, their neurology, their psychology, and their genetics. So depending on the skill set of the MyLab, depending on what kinds of ETs that the MyLab is interacting with, and I would suggest that, that the deep black elements of the military know very well the, the ET profile, if you will, that, that each abductee in MyLab has. Just based simply on a simple blood test and an examination of one's DNA, they can have a very good idea of which types of ETs have genetically uh, influenced their particular family tree, as well as what types of latent metaphysical abilities exist within said DNA. Because ultimately, these MyLabs are operational assets, slaves by any other name. And so, skill sets, for example, some MyLabs uh, on the surface have vocations where they are uh, in the medical field. They may be in biochemistry, they may be uh, uh, first responders, uh, AMBOs as you would call them here, ambulance uh, 
first aid response, uh, responders, so on and so forth. Indeed, the military controllers, the handlers, will even encourage them to become firefighters, will even encourage them to be paramedics. Some people, because of, of their, their, their state, their general state of, uh, of, of health and, and, and their particular skill set, are only useful to the MyLab controllers in what we would call an administrative capacity. They work in these underground bases as, uh, uh, as nurses, as, as uh, biochemists, as, uh, as geneticists, whatever their particular skill set on the surface, they've been mind controlled so they, they have an alter personality which works in these underground bases performing particular tasks which they have been assigned to them. And some, and some people, they retain a lot more conscious awareness of their experiences than others. And, and, you know, the kind of things I hear, I mean, you have to have some black humor about all this, right? They say, it's, you know, I have to work in the surface world, in the workaday world, and then they put me to work in this lab, uh, you know, below the surface, and it's like I'm exhausted, I, uh, I never get any sleep, and, and that's, that's a very common sentiment you hear from my labs, another interesting uh, comment you hear from my labs is they wake up as a feel they as a feeling as if they run a marathon, as if they've been run over by a big diesel truck, as if they've been utilized in all kinds of physical activities. And in some cases they have. Now again it comes back to skill sets and I'll, I'll talk more about the different types of, uh, uh, of, of skill sets in a moment. My labs are utilized in underground bases, but they're also utilized on the surface. And one of the things, a commonality amongst many My labs, is that they have been trained to survive future probabilities on the surface. Again, it ties into what Dan Sherman was told in Project Preserve Destiny. It's what many of us have seen in our futuristic prophetic dreams of cataclysms, fireballs, volcanic activity, so on and so forth, uh, financial collapse, wh whatever the case may be. So they are trained to survive these contingencies, whatever they may be, on the surface. And they're trained individually and in groups. In groups, they're trained to, they're, they're studied, they're analyzed, and they're assessed or leadership potential. And they'll, they're put in scenarios where my labs will be tasked with organizing a group of survivors to carry out certain tasks. And the my lab will say to other my labs, for example, okay, you will go find drinkable water, you will find firewood, you will find uh, food that's edible, that's non-contaminated, because very often in these futuristic scenarios, the environment is completely tainted. It's, it's a nuclear, biological, chemical kind of environment in many cases. Now many of us that have had these prophetic visions and futuristic dreams, we've also had dreams of nuclear detonations, nuclear war, nuclear holocaust, and so on and so forth. That also figures prominently in some of the training that the my labs have been put through where they're expected to survive this nuclear environment. And they'll describe having seen in dreams or in, in virtual reality experiences. I, I must stress for a moment that for the my lab, it's up in the air sometimes what type of experience they're really having or remembering. Are they laying in bed and it's a virtual environment, theater of the mind, and they're they're not really anywhere, they're just laying in their bed, or has their consciousness, their astral body, been taken to some other place, put through its paces, and, and made to take part in these kinds of scenarios. Because the ETs and now the military for some time, they know that we have an emotional astral energetic body, and they interact with it as often as they do with the physical bodies. Anyone who's had real alien abduction experiences knows that it's not simply physical abductions, medical procedures, that, that in itself is a level of gatekeeping, right? And, and, and those gatekeepers uh, have in common, they've never had the experiences, 
or at least they don't admit to having the experiences, and they try to describe it as a cut and dried kind of medical procedure kind of thing, ovum extraction, uh, DNA extraction, hybridization. It's much deeper than that. Any abductee worth his or her salt will tell you that the experience uh, encompasses every state of our being telepathic contact, astral dreamscape manipulation, stage managed dreams where our consciousness is in some place and we're being shown all the symbolic stuff, we're taking, taking on otherworldly visits that seem to be in an interdimensional, out of body kind of thing. And uh, it runs the gamut. It's not any one thing. That's, that's what people have to understand. And these military controllers in cahoots with these different ET groups that they're working with, they know the totality of the human experience and its potential. That's one of the frustrating things is they seem to know more about us than we know about ourselves. They know what our capabilities are. They utilize us in a physical sense, like as combat operatives, uh, as couriers, uh, in some cases, unfortunately, you know, uh, for sex purposes, so on and so forth. But they also utilize my labs in a metaphysical sense. They use them as astral operators. They, they utilize them on spying missions as an astral operative. They utilize them as remote viewers. They have the means to transfer the consciousness of the my lab into other beings, kind of like as walk-ins where they take them over for a while and, and their controllers can see out of the eyes of them and they themselves are inside of some other being. The ETs do this too, because there's spying all across the board. They're spying all across the board. Because within our DNA profile, again, we have the DNA profile abductees and my labs of a number of different races. So people are used as astral operatives, they're used as remote viewers, uh, they're used to interface with ET technology. And what's interesting also is genetics is far more advanced than people have any understanding generally on the surface. What these military controllers have done is they've been able to get into the cloning business essentially. You see, the deep black elements of the military aerospace community have always strived to replicate the capabilities of the different ET races. They've always strived to duplicate, replicate, indeed exceed their capabilities. And one of these capabilities is genetic engineering. So what they do is abductees are routinely cloned out. They're cloned out not only by ETs and different ET groups, some abductees have seen numerous copies of themselves in stasis, in glass tubes. Sometimes they've interacted with, with cloned counterparts of themselves. I've seen my own cloned counterparts of myself. They always seem to be younger, slimmer, don't wear glasses, but I, I've run into them nonetheless, right? And what, what's interesting is what they can do, what the military can do is they can take the consciousness out of the sleeping abductee, place it into a clone counterpart of themselves, and utilize that clone body in hazardous training and or operations. So if the, the MyLab operative in the clone body gets mangled in, in really hazardous training or in, a, or in an op, they simply transfer the consciousness back into the sleeping MyLab, whether the MyLab is at the you know, MyLab base or back in bed, or they transfer the consciousness to another clone and continue the operation. You see, we're, this is like Greek mythology writ large. Well, when I was a boy, I used to read Greek mythology, and to me there was nothing unusual or woo-woo about it. There was nothing unusual about all these different chimeras, all these different beings that were a variety of different races. And, and now, for, from the testimony we're getting for many years now of, of my labs and aerospace engineers and, and, and workers in some of these underground bases, uh, they've seen these genetics labs and they really do create these chimeras, abominations in some cases, things that 
were never really intended to be alive, things that were created in a lab made up of a variety of different uh, life forms. In fact, I, I knew uh, a group of researchers uh, in California who had befriended somebody. It was, they met this guy jogging, of all places. You, you meet these people everywhere in, in all kinds of situations. And it turns out that this guy was a neurologist in the underground bases. And his job, and he would be down there, this is very common, he would be down there for months on end. And then, after three, four, six months, whatever the case may be, he's let loose back on the surface. And, and you know, he ties up kind of any loose ends here on the surface. And then after his vacation is over, he goes back underground. His job was to study the neurology, brainwave patterns, et cetera, of all these genetic mutations that they're creating, right? So keep that point in mind because Genetic engineering means that certain attributes can be, certain desired attributes can be genetically imbued into certain bloodlines and certain, uh, certain progeny, if you will, to make them more psychic. For example, my friend Helga Moro is a class example of another person who was born into these programs. Her father was Frederick Augustus Kepars. He was a German expatriate who, who left Nazi Germany went to America, emigrated to America, joined Douglas Aircraft, which later became, uh, and which later merged after a lot of name changes, became uh, uh, Martin Marietta, uh, Glenn L. Martin, Mark Mar Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if memory serves, it could be a different lineage, but he, he started out in the aerospace industry. One of his friends was Dr. John von Neumann, if you're familiar with uh, the Manhattan Project. Uh, he was a consultant, a mathematician, computer scientist. And according to uh, testimony from Dr. Robert Sarbarker, who was uh, the dean of the Washington Institute of, Te Institute of Technology and was also a, a consultant with the Pentagon with the, the research and development, uh, the Joint Army Research and Development Board in the 1950s and was aware of the uh, back engineering effort based on recovered alien technology, Dr. Robert Sarbacher identified John von Neumann as being directly involved in the back engineering and research of U UFO technology. Well, Helga Moro's father, Dr. Frederick Augustus Kepars, was a friend of John von Neumann. John von Neumann, we used to come to his house. One of Dr. Frederick Augustus Kepar's other friends was another expatriate German who was, a ge who was a geneticist. When Helga was eight months in the womb of her mother, her, her father's geneticist friend stuck a long needle into her, her mother's belly and genetically altered or did something to Helga. The express purpose of which was to make her more intelligent and more psychic. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. Helga became a world-class psychic medium, so on and so forth. Uh, and she herself had her own ET experiences and was involved at some level, but at least uh, as an investigator with, with the Montauk Project. So th those are just examples of the the kinds of ops that my labs are used in. Now here's where things get kind of woo woo, but not really. Because people have to get out of this mindset that what we see on the surface is though the totality of the technology and the technological capabilities which exist to the deep black breakaway civilization as, as Richard Dolan calls them. Because they have an understanding of cosmology, of physics, so on and so forth that is far beyond what the people, the, the academics and the service can even conceive of. And one of the things they do, besides off-world travel, besides uh, establishing uh, space stations, because many my labs report being taken on, taken to uh, space stations out in deep space, they, they report being taken to other planets, and they report being taken in craft. Well, there is also literally a Stargate program, multiple Stargate programs. And these Stargates not only go to other worlds, other star systems in our plane of existence, they also can go to other 
dimensions. They can also go to other timelines. One of the pro programs is, is a time travel project and an alternate reality project. The my labs who contact me tend to be in these really super advanced weird science projects. A lot of my labs describe underground stuff, uh, some space ops, combat ops, either on the surface. My labs are routinely utilized either as astral operatives, remote viewers, or in physical combat on the surface. They've been utilized in, in when they fragmented and destroyed Yugoslavia. They've been utilized in Afghanistan. And they've been utilized in Iraq and, and elsewhere. They've also been utilized in other dimensions and other planes of existence and other alternate timelines. The alternate timeline ops tend to be uh, intelligence gathering, uh, basically stealing technology, stealing uh, manuscripts, stealing documentation. They will go to these other worlds uh, alternate Earths, let's say, and what's commonly described is some of the Earths they've been sent to, counterpart Earths, are they may be a few years behind us. And the way it's been described to me is, okay, we're on the Apple, or the iPhone 5 or 6, they're still on the iPhone 3. That's where they're at. But there's, there's some technology, there's some documentation, blueprints, whatever the case may be, that their controllers want them to acquire. And so they'll find themselves in some university kind of office <laughs> doing a breaking and entering thing, uh, rifling through files, whatever the case may be, and then they, they leave. Uh, that's also done in our timeline, where they're frequently used in, in, in the, these ops uh, to steal information, acquire information. It's not just combat they're utilized in. I know I'm jumping all over the place because there's so many different things they're utilized in. Combat is just one, and it's not just combat against humans here on Earth, but also against aliens. Now, that really does happen. Uh, what's interesting to me is that in some of these alternate Earths, what some of the MyLabs describe to me is that some of them, and I'm guessing the reason why these other alternate Earths are having these kinds of problems is because either they're closer to the galactic core, whatever the case may be, the galactic center. In some of these counterpart Earths, it's an all-out alien invasion where people are in broad daylight are cowering in their homes afraid of getting abducted mostly by the greys and other beings that in itself would tell me that at least in those counterpart realities there is some kind of celestial timetable that those ETs and the powers that be in that particular realm are pushing up against just as the powers that be the reptilian overlords on our planet who work through their reptilian hybrid plantation managers who run the surface world and the sub, a lot of the subsurface world, they also are pushing against a celestially driven timetable, whether it's in the form of celestially driven cataclysms in one form or another. I tend to believe it'll be a series of events running in parallel with one another, not any one thing. And what the MyLabs describe is that the aliens, the abducting aliens, have thrown caution to the winds. They know they have just a limited amount of time before the surface world on that Earth is completely, completely changed over. And so they're abducting and acquiring as much genetic material as possible. It must be understood that what we're dealing here is not simply DNA acquisition. DNA is a currency of the universe. Like I said, within DNA lie the latent metaphysical powers of a number of different ET races, not just one. But it's also, for lack of a better term, what we would call the soul. Because many of these beings, it, it's, they see us as this kind of a product of a lot of different ET races. We have the attributes of a lot of different races. And what the controllers on this planet have done, and you've heard this from many others, is they've created this prison planet grid where we keep reincarnating, coming back here, and, and we have our memories basically wiped of, of our past lives, and, and we're forced to relive and make the same mistakes over and over. And in the process, we create this miasma of, of, 
uh, of pain, suffering, misery, so on and so forth, which these archontic beings feed off of. These archontic beings are essentially parasitic. They feed off of our negative emotions. They, f uh, they, they feed off of the strife and, and, and the, the conflict which they create. Uh, and so w what happens is we have a situation where we just keep coming back with no memory of what we've done before. But some people, some my lab, just ties into the contacty thing that I described earlier. Some my labs know that they have star elders. They have an extended star family. And the, the point of origin varies. Sirius, whether it's Sirius A or B, some, some planetary system within the Sirius system. Orion, very common. The Pleiades, very common. Uh, and I'm just talking about people who know that they're here to do good, to basically unravel the, the, the reptilian overlordship, help raise the frequency of this planet, because I'm here to, I'm a solutions-oriented guy. I'm just not here to just heap all this negativity and doom on you. I, I really do believe that, that good things are coming, but we're going to have to like, overcome a lot of adversity first. It's all about ascension. It's all about sustaining ever higher light frequencies. This is why the powers that be have created this perma chemtrail haze above us in the guise of genetic engineering to cool the planet, whatever lie they're, they're currently using. Part of that also is to conceal all these extra planetary bodies that are in our solar system, combined with the GMO and all this stuff. It, uh, the calcification of our pineal gland is all to keep us in the subservient kind of dumbed down state. But what some my labs know they've done is that somehow they've they've gotten around through a back door and managed to incarnate as a Terran, i.e. human, with some, indeed in some cases, a lot of their past life memories. Now, the people that I'm in contact with, spiritual warriors, every single one of them, they tend to have past lives as, as a shaman or a shamaness or a high priest or a high priestess or uh, an Anuit shaman or uh, and sometimes these lives are interspersed with being military people, commanders. And, and sometimes some of us have been at or near the epicenter of, of quite tyrannical regime, regimes, quite frankly. In some of my past lives, I've helped expand some really tyrannical regimes in a military sense. And I've, I've forgiven myself of that. And, and, and I understand that it's part of, of, of what we're doing here. Because having an understanding of military tactics, strategies, so on and so forth, will be helpful as time goes on. For example, many of us are what I call short turnarounds, i.e., we, we passed away either shortly before, during, or shortly after World War II, which means that uh, what better training, if you will, someone can go through to prepare them for this life now, where we are quick turnarounds, we've endured the crucible of World War II, Sometimes they're on one side or the other. They're oppo sames, as David Icke says. And now they find themselves here. But the point I'm making is those abilities, those innate latent metaphysical abilities as a shaman, as a priestess, as a healer, as a Palladian healer in a past life, as, as a feline lion warrior involved in the Orion Wars millions of years ago, all of that is still within the DNA of people. And this ascension process, this activation process, which is happening because the frequency, the plane of existence we're on, I, I think it's more than just this planet. I think it's beyond the solar system. The, the frequency is increasing. And with it is coming, in many cases, this DNA activation. Because we have the means now to reacquire that ancient stellar wisdom and all the latent metaphysical abilities that come with it. That's a game changer. That's what they don't want us to know. That's why they keep everything at a lights in the sky level. They want to keep everything at the bogus science level and, and be, they count on us to have this shame-based wounded inner child where we water down our own experiences and, and we spin our wheels conducting fruitless UFO investigations instead of going within. Going within and, and, and embracing the totality of ourselves. We are the sum of all our beings. 
Uh, we are the sum of all our parts, rather. <coughs> and the military controllers and the negative ETs know this. They utilize these innate abilities within my labs in their ops to advance their agenda. And that's what we've got to change. Now, sadly, when I look at, go to YouTube, and I look at all these, uh, thank you. When I look at all these my labs, and they call themselves super soldiers, too. Hey, thank you. <coughs> often, often as not, I see some very, I see some people that are, are fragmented, that are, are unhealed, uh, that are non, uh, that have not reintegrated, and I'm still working on it. I'm a work in progress. I'm not going to just pop up here and say, "Oh, I've arrived. I've figured it all out." I'm still working through all this myself. But some of these people would presume to to be perfectly healed and presume to convey their understanding of reality to the the viewing audience on YouTube as if that is the totality of the whole my lab super soldier thing and when i listen to some of these guys they just boast about like killing people and killing aliens and it, it all they're doing is basically boasting about being someone's slave right now one thing i do know is that my labs at times are compelled to do things that they ordinarily would not want to do that ordinarily would be inconceivable to them. Let me give an example. Shortly after this whole bogus war, this never-ending war started or restarted again, a number of my labs were utilized as astral operators, and they were sent to Afghanistan by their controllers. Typically what happens in this particular project is one astral operator will be kind of, think of a command control helicopter flying over a battlefield and they have a comm link with, with headquarters and they have a comm link with the troops, the boots on the ground. Well, there would be an astral operator that had constant telepathic communications with all the other astral operators, as well as the, the base where they came from, where they were sent from. And what they were tasked with was to go through all the tunnel systems in Tora Bora and of course the controllers knew they were there because it was a Saudi bin Laden group that built the whole thing, all these underground bases and surface installations when they were still the good guys and they wanted to cause problems for the Soviets who they suckered into invading Afghanistan in the first place. If you're familiar with the surface level history, that's, that's basically what happened. So they sent these astral operators through these tunnel systems and they would find these people, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, woo-woo, whatever boogeyman we're supposed to be afraid of. The irony is many of those Uzbeks, uh, uh, Chechens, Tajiks were trained in the past by British SAS, U.S. Special Forces, CIA paramilitary, right, double cross. So the astral operator would telepathically say to, to, to their controller back at the installation, I see them, it's a group of men, they're just there in the underground base in, the, in this particular location. What should I do? Oh, don't do anything. We're, we're going to bomb them in a moment. And then the astral operator would say, well, I don't want to get hurt. I want to get out of here. And they would say, don't worry. You're not going to feel a thing. Now, this is probably what happened. Through channels, uh, of course, disguising or, or changing the source of intel, through channels, an airstrike was launched where they would utilize, the, the strike aircraft would utilize uh, bunker busting ordnance. And the MyLab astral operator would stand there, and the next thing you know, the whole cavern system, and, and this wasn't just like rock walls. These were proper built underground facilities with tiled floors and a whole bit. Uh, suddenly, the, this bunker busting ordinance would come through and just wipe everybody out. And then they would send them to another part of the tunnel system and identify uh, people there. And, and similarly, through channels, they would call in another airstrike and, and wipe people out. And, for people that, that have empathy, people that have conscience, that's very disturbing to them, right? Now, there are some, again, uh, neurology that determines psychology, which, determines, you know, which is determined by genetics. Some people revel in that. Oh, I get to kill people. I'm a super soldier, right? But some people, it troubles them greatly. Here's another thing that astral operators were, uh, were tasked with doing in, uh, in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan and also uh, in the Balkans when they fragmented Yugoslavia. 
the astral operator would be floating uh, astrally over like a town or some settlement. And in their field of vision, they would, it would be gridded out with, with bright red lines like a big tic-tac-toe. And each square would have a numbered designation, D3, L4, whatever the case may be. What they would do, these astral operators would, uh, would do, is they would adjust fire like a forward observer would on the surface. And so ordnance would come in, either artillery or airstrike. And then they would say, like, uh, it's miss D3. Uh, you know, over a couple of boxes or whatever, and then eventually they'd walk the ordinance over and they'd just kill those people, right? And it could just be any group of people, a wedding party or a week later the funeral for the people who were killed at the wedding party, whatever the case may be, whatever excuse worked, right? And I know the people that were tasked with doing that were deeply troubled by it, as, as we all would be. If we have empathy, if we have a conscience, if we don't like being used as slaves, and so my personal beef, when I, when I hear from all these my labs who call themselves super soldiers, and they boast about going around killing people, what they ought to do is figure out how to throw off the shackles of the mind control, reintegrate, heal, and utilize their abilities against their controllers, is what they should do. That's what I would do. But that's just me. So while I still have time, uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about one of the scenarios that, that my labs have been tasked with. And I think that my intuitive feeling talking with other my labs is because of their ability to look into the future and, and to send people in, in a future timeline, ops in this timeline, and their ability to, to send operatives into alternate realities, alternate Earths, they know, they have a very good idea, if they game plan it out, what the likely scenarios that would occur in our surface world when the time comes. Believe it or not, believe it or not, many of these my labs for many years now have been trained to survive, indeed thrive in, what amounts to a zombie meltdown. Now, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about what's been going on in the surface world. In the surface world, via predictive programming, we've been hammered with like endless movies about zombies, pandemics, pathogens, morphing people into bloodthirsty zombies, so on and so forth, to the point where in America, law enforcement and the National Guard, and this is found in open source publishing, this is not found in, I mean, it didn't start out in alternative web news websites, it started start out in open source publishing mainstream news, official dispatches and, and announcements from law enforcement and the National Guard, they're preparing for a zombie-like attack, a zombie apocalypse, a zombie meltdown. In fact, in these training scenarios, they tell people, they tell uh, the law enforcement and the National Guard to shoot people if they're deemed to be zombies. Now, zombies could be a euphemism. It could be someone who's infected with this, that, or the other pathogen. Suddenly Ebola is in the news again, right? Suddenly well, the whole world is under threat. Right after we've been hammered by movies like World War Z and, and, and uh, I Am Legend, just, just softening up the public, right? Because it just, these are TV watchers, these are fluoride drinkers, these are people that are in, absolutely incapable of independent thought. So it's been hammered into their conscious and their subconscious that, well, one day we're just going to be overrun by zombies. Well, what's interesting is the my labs that I've talked to have been told by some of their military controllers that there are elements within the shadow government, deep black military, not necessarily their own faction, because again, we were talking factions here that run in parallel with one another. But they have their own spies in these other agencies and these other black ops. They, have, they remote view them. They astrally spy on them, so on and so forth. They know that a pathogen has been developed that will, for all intents and purposes, turn people into zombies. And really nothing is simpler because it'll, it'll just destroy cognitive function. That's already happening with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I mean, all you got to do is read the warning labels of, the, of some of these psychotropic drugs. It's like, geez, you're giving me this for depression, right? So 
we already see that it's happening with some of the psychotropics. Just a little bit more manipulation here and there of the ingredients, and then you have this pathogen, virus, whatever the case may be. And oftentimes they work in binary or multiple uh, weaponized fashion. It's not just sometimes like a chemtrail, there's like nano elements to the chemtrail. And, and the chemtrail itself is, is uh, catalyzed, activated for specific purposes by heart, scalar wave. We've all seen the sugar cookie effect. We've all seen the, the, the different types of you know, permachem trailhaze above us. Uh, and then you combine that with, with the GMO and, and, and everything else that's been going on. I can see it, it, it's quite possible that, that a zombie apocalypse can be engineered. Now we've already seen people, to use the old term, become berserkers, running around naked and, and just going nuts. Now paradoxically, paradoxically, when these guys are running around nuts and, and, and it's all filmed on YouTube, no one ever shoots them, right? Whereas if a guy's walking along with a cane, cop says, I felt, uh, I was in fear for my life, so I plugged him full of holes, threw on another mag and emptied another mag into him. I was afraid for my life. But these guys that run around uh, naked and just going nuts, oh, they seem to just be left alone, right? They don't just kill them like they do, like ordinary people who are just minding their own business, which to me is pretty sus, if you ask me. Okay, back to the my lab uh, aspect. What's interesting is that some my labs that have been sent in these, what they perceive to be intuitively, these alternate realities, these alternate Earths, where this zombie meltdown has already occurred, they're sent to lead survivors out of the woods, out of the cities. That's a very common tactical scenario where they, they are sent to these, these alternate Earths and they're tasked with other my labs to lead a group of survivors out of the city into the woods into the country. Typically what they do is they wait till first light because you can see the zombies better. They can jump down from rooftops, they can pop up from behind trees, whatever the case may be. And when these my labs are in that role, they are calibrated for combat. And, and, and they are well trained too. They've been trained in weapons, not only like surface level weapons, but quite exotic weapons. But typically in these zombie apocalypse scenarios, they use typical surface level automatic weapons, that kind of thing. And there'll be a guy at point in front and just, uh, you know, slice of the pie, so to speak, sighting down at any potential target. There'll be a back marker watching the rear and there'll oftentimes be two, two people on either side uh, and they lead this group of survivors out. And they're into it. it it's like they're in the combat warrior mode where, uh, you know what, they're not gonna get me and they may get some of these people I'm, uh, I'm trying to get out of here, but they're not going to get all of them, right? They're really mission-oriented. Now, that's just one possibility. Now, what's interesting is I was trying to get a timeline. I'm not one to come up with timelines and affix dates because people are going to hold it against you later on, right? Uh, and, and a lot of people have come under criticism for predicting this, that, or the other catastrophe coastal flooding, whatever, and, you know, the date comes and goes and nothing happens and the credibility suffers as a result. But some of, one of the most trusted my labs I've known for over 20 years now, at least, she told me that she recently, well, this is about seven, eight months ago, she was in this futuristic zombie apocalypse scenario. And it must be emphasized that she is utilized by a branch of the military that has time travel capability. In fact, they've used the time travel capability to show her things which always came to pass, right? In fact, one time they showed her that her daughter, who's now a beautiful 20-something year old, was going to be kidnapped by a guy and then sold into a sex slavery human trafficking ring. They showed her the guy escaping with her daughter the whole bit in a futuristic sense. Well, long story short, I mean, she, she called the police and she prevented the whole thing from happening. So that's just an example of how they've shown her things in the future which have come to pass. See, and it's not done for altruistic purposes. Let's make that very clear. When they train these my labs, 
to survive all these possible contingencies, it's not because they care for them necessarily, it's because they're operational assets. They've, some of these people were literally, I mean people, uh, males and females were put together uh, through a series of circumstances, made to have children just to continue this MyLab bloodline operation. So the, these MyLab ops are generations or decades in the making. So when they're training these people to survive, it's, it's not necessarily because they're good guys or they're, it's being done for altru altruistic reasons. They're operational assets. And they tell them, they tell them when the time comes, when people are being herded onto the trains, when people are being sent to the camps, when people are told to go to the hospitals, don't go. Don't go. Just training will kick in. You'll know where to go when the time comes. Right? That's what they tell them. Well, in this case, she was sent on this time travel alternate reality scenario where it was a zombie meltdown. Uh, I think there was even a nuclear uh, uh, aspect to it. And she was running and trying to survive with, her, uh, with members of her family. And she's been told, when the time comes, you're going to have to harden your heart. You can't have around the people around you that are just luggage and they can't pull their own weight and you just love them and you feel sorry for them. Uh, they're going to have to uh, be able to cut the corn. Or, or just leave them behind. And you're going to be seeing a lot of people, children, adults, elderly, that you can't help. You're just going to have to carry on, right? So all of this training and this mindset has been imbued into her for decades now, and her daughters, by the way, who are now young adults. And in this scenario, they're running from, they're, they're fighting zombies, they're running from zombies, it's a post-nuclear environment. Uh, and she said, I asked her, because a light bulb went on in my head, I go, uh, how old does your grandson look like in this scenario? Well, he looks like he would be about six years old. And I go, oh, that's interesting. How old is he now? Well, he's almost three, right? And that was like a year and a half. That was like eight months a year ago. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do the math here. So if this scenario pans out, I said to her, we may see something like this 2016, 2017, something like that. She goes, yeah, that's, that's what I am picking up. And, and other my labs have been shown similar things of, of, of coastal flooding uh, in, in the East Coast, coastal flooding on the West Coast of America. When I say the East Coast, I mean the East Coast of, of America and the, and the West Coast of America. Basically, coastal flooding all over the world. So. My lab training, so on and so forth. And before I run out of time here, I got to talk a little bit about reptilian abductions and then actually leave you with a happy ending, good message. Because I don't want you to leave here thinking that I'm all doom and gloom and I'm not solutions oriented, because I am. It's just that there's so much information. And Okay. Uh, I'll talk more about this later, but the... Uh, there's a lot of electromagnetic beaming that goes on with my labs. You see, what they do is a lot of the programming happens when one is asleep. So they'll beam a part of the brain, for example, the frontal lobe, which I'll talk a lot about when, when I talk about the reptilian part. The frontal lobe is our impulse control center. It, it's what prevents us from acting out in an impulsive, berserk, violent, sadistic fashion, right? Well, what the MyLab controllers do, and it, 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 there's different groups that do this. It, these deep black groups that work, I call them project people generically, not just MyLabs people in the Monarch program, people in MKUltra program. Generically, I call them project people. And oftentimes, when they find out about a project person in another project, they're going to start asking that accessing that person. So this is why they monitor forums where these people get together and they talk and they share stories because they know that, okay, I never heard of this guy before. I'm going to start accessing him, right? So one of the things they do is they beam a part of the brain which engenders the, the, the sleep, heavy, heavy sleep response where your eyelids feel like they weigh a ton and you just can't keep them open because by keeping the eyes closed and forcing them to go into REM sleep, forcing them to, to be in deep sleep, they can create a theater of the mind through the electromagnetic beaming of another part of the brain. So this is one example of how they, they 
mind control someone via electromagnetic beaming into becoming impulsive, into becoming violent. Uh, with a lot of these, like, project people, males, you always hear stories of them, like, having domestic violence issues, of being thrown in jail, and all this other stuff. It doesn't matter to the controllers, because they can access them in jail anyway. So they'll beam a part of their brain, which engenders the, the deep sleep response. Then they'll also beam the frontal lobe to just chip away at, at the impulse control center. And then what they'll do is they'll create within the mind of the sleeping person this virtual environment where they see themselves, it could be indoors, outdoors, combination of both, where they're always being set upon by crowds of people, crowds of people attacking them, kicking them, jostling them, grabbing them. And what the controllers do is they, they beam them in such a way as, as they feel physical sensations in the sides of their, their head, their face, where they're just being battered around. They actually feel this because it engenders that, that animalistic fear response, that fight or, or f flight response. And in these virtual realities, they're getting attacked constantly. Just as they escape from one mob of people, they run into another mob of people, and they're getting attacked again, right? And the intention behind it is to, to wear away at the impulse control center because they want to use them in operations where they will have no empathy, no conscious, no none of that. They just want them to just be sadistic, born killers, let's say, okay? Uh, that's, that's one example of, of the MyLab training uh, via electromagnetic beaming. Another thing that they do is they, they will beam that part of the brain uh, of someone that will make them sleep. Because sometimes what happens is they, they're, they're getting the rapid eye movement. And they know that they're having some mind control experience because they've gone through it before. So they pry their eyes open, and then the movie stops. Okay, The movie stops. But then the beaming of the part of their brain intensifies because you know, they, they know that they've opened their eyes. So the beaming intensifies, and their eyes, eyelids feel like they weigh a ton again, and they close their eyes. The moment they close their eyes, the movie starts up again. They're back in this virtual environment training scenario. And, uh, Sometimes they can find themselves in a scenario where they're laying in a hospital bed when their eyes are closed, and there, there could be like two big TV screens up on brackets up on the wall of this hospital bed, and there's some kind of activity on the screens. It could be some kind of sporting event, like a footy game, a bunch of people running around. Uh, but it, usually there's more to it than that. There's an underlying purpose, because a key element of mind control is OCD installing these obsessive compulsive uh, disorder thought loops and installing OCD thought loops of a negative uh, nature, like of despair, of hopelessness, of, of anger, resentment, loneliness, suicide, because emotions are things in the spirit world and that tends to lower the vibration of the person down, opens them up for more mind control and even entity attachment if you want to go that far. So the person pries his eyes open, and then he's back in his own bed, but then the beaming intensifies, he closes his eyes, and he's back laying in the hospital bed, medical-looking facility, looking at these big TVs up in the bracket showing some kind, of, some kind of activity. And there's variations of this. A lot of times what they'll do is, before they return somebody from an op, when they've either trained them or they've, they've utilized them in an op, they'll, they'll sit them down, either physically uh, or in an astral state, in, in this virtual environment state, in what appears to be a darkened theater, in a, in a big theater screen. And the theater screen will have a whole bunch of action sequences running nonstop of car chases, of war, of, 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 of fight scenes, whatever the case may be, the purpose of which is to scramble their, their brains up so that is what they remember when they wake up. So they don't remember the ops they've been on. They don't remember the training they've been on. And, and it must be understood that, again, one of my pet peeves with all these people that you know, call themselves super soldiers is they don't see the amount of, of, of trauma that people have endured. They don't see the amount of, uh, of, uh, of hardship they've endured. For example, it's not unusual for, for female my labs to be used as sex slaves, to be gang raped in, in these underground bases, off-world installations. Uh, 
And it's not unusual for the, the clones of, of female MyLabs to be utilized as prostitutes in these underground bases to be, uh, or off-world installations, right? So uh, they're, 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 this is a human tragedy that's going on, and, and that's part of the reason why I, I do what I do. But anyhow, before I run out of time, because there's so much information, I want to talk a bit about the reptilians. And, and now, we've heard enough about, I'll just run through some sketches made by a MyLab. Uh, this is from Patty Jackson. She's in, in Michigan. She used to work with law enforcement, but she's a MyLab herself. Uh, that's her on the left, again, in, in dark BDU, SWAT-type kind of outfit, some kind of utility belt. She's in operator mode. There's some kind of dolphin being there. There's a reptilian, and there's some kind of a guy in a, in a lab coat. Uh, she's here getting harshly interrogated. Many abductees, my labs have gone through this gun to their head, threatened, uh, interrogated, debriefed. Uh, I told you earlier about how they utilize clones in, in these ops where they put the consciousness of, of, of my labs into clones and then if the clones get mangled or killed, then they simply switch them to another body. Well, here's an example of that, where she witnessed like these tubes of all these bodies missing body parts, right? Uh, that's her being trained uh, to fly uh, some kind of craft, very common amongst abductees and my labs that, uh, see the ETs have their own standalone operations, even those ETs that, are, that interact with deep black elements of the military aerospace. And they, they train their my labs, uh, their abductees and my labs, to interface with ET technology, in some cases fly ET craft. I've spoken to many people who, uh, who've been trained to fly certain types of ET craft. And the control systems vary. Sometimes they look like as simple as a joystick. Other times it's more like crystal kind of, uh, crystal kind of controls. But that, that's Patty uh, being trained. And she's also had these experiences with these orb orbs and these hooded beings, these, these really uh, spiritually advanced monk type beings. Okay, and uh, reptilians, essentially three kinds. There's, they're subterranean, they're extraterrestrial, and they're interdimensional. But they're not mutually exclusive. That's another bogus fault line created mostly by Dr. Jacques Vallée. Because when Jacques Vallée was going on and on about, oh, there's, it's interdimensional, uh, star systems are too far, blah, 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 quack, quack, quack. What he did was he neatly sidestepped the hardware issue, where over the decades all these crashes occurred and ongoing interaction with uh, different types of ET races, right? So, and not only that though, but some of the extraterrestrial races are themselves interdimensional. Indeed, I just got telling you how some deep black elements of the military are sending their, their operatives to alternate Earths and, uh, in the past and in the future of this timeline. What's interesting also is, is uh, some of these, these deep black military groups have carved out for themselves what are essentially niches, what are essentially bases in other planes of reality, not just in this plane. It's, it's very common, especially with the MyLabs that I talk to, where they tell me that they can be trained or they can just seem to live in, in, in this installation uh, with the military controllers and or ETs and they could be there for hours or days or even weeks and They will start to freak out. They, they're saying look. I've got to get back. I've got to wake up my children I got to get them ready for school and they say don't worry We'll send you back in time and even if it seems that as, as if weeks have passed in this other realm when they send them back Sure enough, they wake up right before they have to get the kids up so they have this ability and so it's not only that they are on this plane and they have this ability, they've carved out these niches for themselves in these other planes. That's just the military. Not all the factions, I just suspect some. So some are subterranean, some are extraterrestrial, and some are interdimensional, and the interdimensional and ex extraterrestrial are not mutually exclusive. This came from Baghdad, um, uh, this came from Iraq somewhere, so perhaps Babylonian, Sumerian. Uh, people have even encountered reptilian beings with a wand-like device. Now, what people need to understand is that 
These reptilians are the controlling factor. We reside within their sphere of influence. It's the architecture of control. They've done it through hybridization. David Icke talks about this. I talk more about, time permitting, the internal dynamics of how this is all done. And uh, what they've done, and look at the picture on the right. I'm going to talk about that, time permitting. Process of elimination, statistical probability. Maybe some of you in this room uh, or loved ones, friends of yours, have had the experience of a reptilian rape. And what happens is these reptilians Im imbue uh, their genetics in the certain bloodlines, and they track these bloodlines. I call them familiars, you know, underscore the family part, familiars, where they track them generation after generation. And oftentimes these women, not always, but some of them will have um, uh, RH negative, which is interesting because RH stands for the rhesus monkey, which they're supposedly negative from. No, no existence or basis of any primate uh, DNA. So it begs the question, well, if it's not primate DNA, then what is? Well, what is it? And what these reptilians do is they see these human females as their mate because they've been, these women have essentially been genetically engineered to, to be able to be raped by these reptilians. What they do, and this is how the onset of reptilian rape often happens, where the woman will feel a sudden weight on her chest. She's, she's paralyzed, she's immobilized, and then she may begin to feel penetration. Uh, now, the being could choose to be invisible, and a lot of the women like write these things off as being sexual dreams or something, right? So the, the entity can choose to be invisible uh, in the visible spectrum, and they can do that. But paradoxically, they can leave an impression of weight on, on, on a surface, on a mattress, on a carpet, while they're invisible. So it can choose to be invisible when it's raping the woman, or it can choose to assume the guise of, a, of an ex-lover, of someone she currently has a crush with, uh, very commonly, the reptilians utilize the image of famous entertainers or musicians. And I've, I, I've heard them all, uh, uh, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Bruce Springsteen. It, it really depends on what the woman, who the woman is attracted to, who the woman kind of has a crush on. They will assume that guys. And it's not only a physical uh, process, but it's an energetic process. What the reptilians are able to do is they're able to engender full body orgasms within the woman. And, and sometimes these full body orgasms can last literally for hours, leaving the woman breathless and debilitated. And then the entity leaves. And there are uh, marked side effects to these reptilian sexual assaults. Yeast infections, candidiitis, uh, sometimes vaginal bleeding because the member of these entities is, is, is very large. Uh, and uh, also other side effects, like in the days after these visitations, the women could be very psychic. Their, their, their psi abilities amp up. In fact, and I know we've got to wrap it up here pretty soon. Uh, in fact, I know of a case where the deep black elements of the military shared a base with reptilians. This was in the high desert of Southern California in the Victorville, Barstow, Atalanto area. And, uh, that whole area is a hot zone of, of military, reptilian, ET activity. No sooner had the reptilian left after raping the woman, the, the MyLab friend of mine, that the military immediately teleported her to their underground installation. In the old days, they, they took them away with vans, took them away with helicopters. Nowadays, they just literally teleport them. And so the moment the reptilian left, the military teleported her to the underground base and in her heightened uh, uh, psychic state, her chi is amped up. They immediately tasked her with remote viewing operations in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. So that tells me that either they were aware that the reptilian had done that to her and were simply exploiting this fact, or they were working in cahoots, which I tend to believe the latter, because we had two different remote viewers, world-class remote viewers, remotely view that particular underground base, which we had been investigating for years. and we. We had each of them, unbeknownst to one another, draw the interior of the base and, and, and where the reptilian stayed, where the, the human stayed, so on and so forth. So we know they work, with, work together. Now, if the woman is laying there uh, paralyzed, but say she's able to move her hand and she tries to block the member of the reptilian, 
she will find that even though she's able to move her hand in front of her loins, she still cannot block, she still cannot block the member of, of the reptilian, which, which is paradoxical. And, and it speaks to the fact that the reptilians are masters of frequency and resonance. Tesla said, with resonance, anything is possible. And, the, and these beings are masters of, of, of resonance and frequency. Now, think about that. Uh, the gal has like layers of, 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 um, of bed sheets, uh, comforters, and call them dunas here, uh, bed clothes, and she can cover her hand, she can cover her private parts with her hand, yet paradoxically she still can't block the penetration. It's still going on. And one last thing before you know, I stop and, and take any questions is uh, what they can do if they want to engender the fear response, they will manifest in their full scaly glory where the woman sees them and she's terrified because what that do does is, you see, we are resonators. We emit frequencies. And it behooves these negative beings for us to emit frequencies of de despair, of depression, of unhappiness, of loneliness, of isolation. Get us in these negative OCD thought loops where, where all those negative thoughts just bounce around in our heads like an echo chamber. Well, what they do is, uh, when they manifest as reptilians, and if the woman is, is frightened of them, they feed off her fear. They literally, they literally absorb the fear that, that she's emitting. And one last thing is, these beings have the ability, whether it's they plug into her memory banks or they plug into the, the information field, as David Icke call, calls it, because virtually all perps, serial murderers, child molesters, so on and so forth, are themselves either Draco human hybrids or reptilian human hybrids who operate in a hive consciousness fashion, right? And I just wish I had more time to talk about this. What the reptilian could do while it's raping the woman is make the woman relive even a childhood sexual assault. And she will relive it in real time and she will also uh, have uh, the suppressed body memories come back up while the entity is raping her. You see, whether, see to me it's all reptilian, archontic inspired. Whether the controllers of a particular mind control group appear to be all human, I guarantee you some of them are hosts for reptilian entities. Some of them are even shapeshifters. Now the thing about it is, People can be taken up as a host, not just by reptilians, but by mantis beings, by greys, by, they can have, be indwelled by positive beings, Palladians, lion beings, whatever the case may be. See, there's a genetic predisposition, uh, and indeed a spiritual predis predisposition, and this is just what shamans and medicine men and seers and mystics have known all along. There's, no, there's nothing unusual about it. So they have a way of engendering those old, suppressed, blocked, memories because when people are traumatized at any age and if that block traumatic energy is not moved out uh, it stays in there to be reaccessed and reutilized by these negative beings now one last thing uh, and then I'll take some questions is it's, this is a frequency war this is why we're being hammered not only with scalar waves harp and GMO food everything is meant to keep us in this dross physical body being hammered at an early age with vaccines so on and so forth and it's the content of what passes for the entertainment industry, where we're just being hammered by constant uh, uh, imagery of, of, like for example, the unreality shows, as I call them, where they depict boorishness, irrationality, stupidity as, as chic and trendy things, right? Where it's like people watch these things and those who are impressionable think it's cool to be boorish and irrational and, and um, basically unpleasant. Those are precisely the kinds of OCD thought loops they want to engender within the population at large. My, my mentor, Bob, Robert Bartholick, talked about the Breed Out the Love program, where, where children at an increasingly early age were becoming more sadistic and, and so on and so forth. And we can see that. We can see bullying is at an all-time high, and the, the sadism meted out by, by even teenagers these days is just off the charts, especially animal cruelty, too. So it's a frequency war, and it's important that we raise our frequency internally. No matter what's going on around us, we must, as much as possible, strive to maintain an inner harmony, strive to maintain equilibrium. You folks are luckier than most. You're in Australia. You, I mean, you can go to the Blue Mountains. You can go 
country, Queensland country, New South Wales, some of the places you live at are very high energetic places. Uh, and, and embrace your Aussiness, embrace the original people here. Uh, if you get a chance, study the work of Stephen and Evan Strong, where they prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this latest revision of humanity, be it 4.0, 5.0, whatever the case may be, started here in Australia. The Aboriginals were the original people. And what better people for the Palladians, because the, uh, the, the Aboriginals say, all people on Earth stem from us. And, uh, and even the Native Americans in, in North America, they say, a lot of them say, we came from Australia first, and before Australia, we came from the Palladians, Sirius, whatever, whatever constellation they particularly hail from. And, and Stephen and Evan Strong uh, are in tight with the elders of this country. And the elders have said, the time is now for all this stuff to come out. And they have proven through mitochondrial DNA research passed down through uh, the mother line, and they proved through Y chromosome research, uh, leveraging the research done by others uh, and, and using it to support their case that, yes, indeed, that, that uh, humanity didn't start in Africa. That's just another lie. It started right here. And what better caretakers of the land for the Palladians to leave here? People, uh, you know, I, I know that, uh, forgive me the vegans in the crowd, but, but it's like the North American Plains Indians and, and, and Aboriginals, after this latest series of celestially during cataclysms, they had to survive, okay? So, but they were not taught by the bad ETs. The bad ETs taught them agriculture. <laughs> taught agriculture, taught animal husbandry, right? Agriculture rapes the land. Animal husbandry, husbandry uh, demeans and, and harms animals. What the North American Indians, and I'm sure uh, uh, natives in South America, elsewhere, and especially here in, in Australia, they've been taught to live in consonance with the land. They've taught to honor the animals as our brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, like the academics roll their eyes when they hear Native Americans talk about brother raven and brother raccoon. They are our brothers and sisters. What's interesting, too, is the, the gatekeeper alien abduction researchers, who shall remain nameless, they would have us believe that there's only grays, grays and more grays, and hybrid variants of grays. They completely dis try to debunk reptilians, and they certainly try to debunk uh, reports of human-looking aliens. In fact, they say, oh, those are just hybrids of, of grays and humans but there's entire, that's completely wrong. What people don't realize is there are, there are two-legged analogs, humanoids, of the four-legged beings we have here. There are, there are feline beings in the universe, lion beings, cat beings, uh, beings that look like jaguars, but they're humanoid, and they're on our side. Some of you are descended from them. There are, there are canine-looking beings, uh, lichen beings, and you know, those stories, people don't only shapeshift into reptilians, they shapeshift into, well, lichen beings, wolf beings, feline beings. It runs the gamut. So it's a frequency war. And I just encourage you just to keep all that in mind. Uh, I've kind of run over time again. Uh, and I, I really want to thank you for being attentive. Uh, and I really, really appreciate you coming. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer them. Thank you. Yes, and they do exist. They, yeah. they're, they're, they're real. Yes. And, and see, I've been bagged a lot in the past for it. You only talk about the, right and the negative beings. But like I said at the outset, it's like they're the ones causing the problems. But I, I must say, in all fairness, there are positive reptilian beings. Uh, indeed, there are people who claim, I have no reason to doubt them, that they used to be a reptilian in a past life, have chosen to reincarnate in this life to help undo the damage that some of the other reptilian races have done. Uh, indeed, if, if one follows the lore and, and see, the people that I know, they don't just get like channeling, right? The channeling they get is like, uh, we can't talk right now. The reptilians are opening a portal. We have to stop them. End of transmission, right? The, the, the kind of people I'm in combo with, commu communicate with, uh, they're plugged into some high-level positive beings. And like I said, it, it's conflict and combat throughout the cosmos. So there are positive uh, beings. It, it, it's, it's a plane of dualities. And the dualities are becoming more, and polarities are becoming more extreme. And, and we have to help 
I don't have time to talk about it, but we have to raise not only the, the frequency of this planet, but the whole plane, uh, so we can stop this endless cycle of, of, of you know, polarities. Um, anyone else have a question? Hello, James. Hi. Thanks for that, uh, that comprehensive information. Quick question. Does any of that information that you've given us tonight uh, conjure DS classified military secrets? That's interesting because uh, that's a good question. In, in some of the underground bases, from what I understand, uh, Bill Hamilton is an outstanding researcher in Southern California. He used to be a Russian linguist for, for, for Air Force Security Service and the NSA, and he had his own contactee experiences. He was part of that whole giant rock crowd in, in Southern California when, when a lot of people were being contacted. And uh, he developed a lot of sources in the underground bases. See, the Antelope Valley in Southern California is where the, the aerospace corporations are, are based. Uh, and there's a lot of underground bases there that are connected with, well, they're all connected, a lot of them, with Edwards Air Force Base, China Lake, et cetera. His sources tell him that the documentation that lay around on the desk in the underground bases, they're not classified, which, which makes sense because at that level, it's not so much classification or need to know its levels of consciousness. It, it's purity of, of a particular type of DNA. Uh, people that don't really have a need to know but still have, from their standpoint, a useful function, they simply mind control them, right? Because there's a lot of mind control in the, in the underground bases. So uh, what I've shared with you is if it's for all intents and purposes, it's a limited hangout because it, it's you see the efforts of debunking that's going on, right? Just for simple sightings and whatnot, and, and landed uh, craft incidents. They can't really like, go out of their way to debunk these kinds of things. All they can do is infiltrate it. All they can do is send in their mind-controlled my labs to kind of muddy the waters a bit. And a lot of these male my labs especially have been like going off the rails and just freaking out. I must say, and this is directly in line with the divine, the, the return of the divine feminine, finally, right? Because there has to be balance between divine masculine and divine feminine. Uh, it's been my observation going back 20 years plus now that, that women tend to hold this together a lot better. Female abductees and female my labs seem to be more heart-centered, they seem to be more comfortable in their own skin, uh, less ego-driven. Uh, males that have been subjected to this uh, tend to be more fragile. Uh, if they're abductees, they, they don't like to delve into their own experiences or, or into the abduction phenomena in general. They prefer to study crop circles or, or sighting reports or uh, things that are kind of at arm's length. They're afraid to go within again, right? One of the most profound things I've ever, had, I've ever heard was I attended a conference uh, years ago. It was a star family gathering of the Lakota elders. And one of the Lakota elders said, men, you have to become more feminine. And, and what he meant by that was get in tune with the feminine aspect because that's where our power is. See, because what they've done, the archontic control system is this post this latest series of selectively driven cataclysms is after the survivors came out of their caves, there was a small, smaller group of a sur surface population for the reptilians and other genetic tampering ETs to mess with. So what they did was they started imbuing their DNA and their patriarchy into these bloodlines. They imposed alphabet language vice and, and they supplanted and got rid of symbol language. Symbols speak to us at a soul, celestial archives, celestial record keeping level. Whereas letters are turned into words which are written by scribes, which turn into laws, which are enforced by priesthoods. You see where it goes. And it's always patriarchal. Always. The witch hunts which happened for centuries in Europe, that was hardcore reptilian patriarchy systematically wiping out women uh, on the flimsiest pretenses, right? So what I see it, it, as part and parcel of the return of this divine feminine is uh, 
these women, the women have always been the pioneers in the alien abduction field. I'm not talking about sighting reports. I'm talking about in the field of alien abductions in my lab research, Dr. Carla Turner, Barbara Bartholik, uh, so a lot of the early my labs that went public in America, Alicia Davidson, Diane Johnson, Candy Turner herself, almost all were women, you see? So to me, that's encouraging. And another thing about, about the divine feminine is that's where our power is. That's where telepathy is. That's where astral travel is. And I'm not talking about just lurking in the lower astral planes. I'm talking about going into the inner planes, right? And that's why it goes back to getting back into an indigenous living in harmony with, with, with our surroundings and, and this planet and, and the greater cosmos. So I don't know if I answered your question. The long and the short of it is, no. The, uh, what, what have I received? What I've, See, ultimately, this is non-confirmable intelligence. What I, everything I've, I've shared, because they'll never recognize it as real. However, it will resonate with a lot of people in the aerospace community, whistleblowers, or people who work down there, as well as other my labs. And, that, and that's who keeps contacting me, is all these other my labs and abductees. Thank you. Let me summarize what you said. Yes. The way I see it, after all these explanations, is that all the ETs are aspiring Spielbergs. <laughs> and the My Lab people are the Tom Cruises and the Angelina Jollies of this world. The rest of us are just the extras. I wouldn't go that far, but I, but I, but I see where you, uh, see you're going. I, I only point out, just to interject for a second, is that you know, I have to direct the information towards those having the experiences. Now, that's not to say, because uh, some of you are so spiritually evolved that, and metaphysically involved that you don't even regard your interactions with ETs, interdimensional spirit guides as, as even unusual, it's just the way it is for you. You see what I mean? So, and as a matter of fact, the, the people that I interact with, that's what they're like. It's like they just happen to have ET experiences, but... I'm not contradicting what you yeah, said. Yeah. I didn't finish oh, okay. what I said. What I'm saying. And the Pleiadians and all the goodies up there are just the spectators watching us and thinking, when are these people going to wake up to the reality of this world and yes. realize it's just a role they're playing yes. and they can opt out of it anytime they want to? Yes, yes, thank you. And what I've come to understand, this is just gut in, in, intuitional kind of understanding, is that Again, it, it's an extension of, of these cosmic wars going way back. It's all coming down in our little corner of the multiverse. It really is, because we're talking about billions of souls, and increasingly more and more people that are essentially soulless because of all the genetic engineering, so on and so forth. There's a lot of empty vessels out there, and they wind up you know, in all these different politics, politics and law enforcement. And well, it's a lot, in law enforcement, a lot of them are full-on reptilian hybrids. But what, what I see it, and, and I hate to liken it in terms to, to warfare, you know, proxy warfare is what I would liken it to, but a lot of the people that are Palladian contactees, that who I regard as spiritual warriors, I mean, they don't just sit around in a lotus position and, you know, and, I mean, they're, they're active participants. They're, they're, they're in the fight, okay? And, and they, they're always constantly trying to raise a frequency. What I've seen is that these different beings, Palladians and whatnot, they have, they have infiltrated people like yourself into our earthly plane because you tend to hold, you, you anchor a higher frequency, okay? People that are of, of a certain genetic ET lineage and, and if they can overcome all the adversity that's thrown their way, all the, sometimes what they'll do, the archontic entities is, they'll insert people who technically are part of your soul group, but, it, it, but they're just so negative. And in, in many cases, they're full-on hosts for Dracos or reptilians or some other malevolent being. They'll insert them into your family unit just to knock you off course, just to chip away at your self-esteem, your self-worth, and just leave you feeling like a shame-based, wounded inner child where you can't say no to anyone. And You know what I mean? And so... What happens is, when one overcomes that, that adversity, we become by overcoming, right? It's like 
Show me someone who's never failed, I'll show you a failure. The cliches are coming thick and fast now, but it's true. We think about the, the, the handicaps that we have. Just average people. And every person has latent metaphysical abilities, but you know, they're eating Maccas all the time, hammered with fluoride. It's just, they, they, they're, they're cut off from the divine source. They're cut off from their own true self. What the really, really positive ETs always say is, stop coming to us for questions about what wallpaper to put up. Go within. That's what they tell over and over. That's the message. Because we're celestial records keepers in our own right. We're, 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 we're plugged directly in. We're a manifestation of divine source. And that's what the archontic forces have done. They've detached us from that. Right? What, what David Icke talks, the, the mind-body computer, we're just, we're just automatons, just thoroughly environmentalized, just living out our lives day to day, no different than a fly stuck in a piece of fly paper, right? No, we're more than that. We're a multi-dimensional infinity. And so what these e different ET races have done is they've, they've, they've created their own genetic bloodlines and they've had us reincarnate at key moments in Earth's history in this timeline. You see, that's another part of, of the solution is we have to fix this timeline. That's something that just it's a whole other subject entirely. But, but there are key nodal points in, in our current timeline. And the problem is that so many of these archontic beings with time travel capability, they've really messed up the timelines. They've created alternate timeline streams. They've really messed things up, right? So we have to not only fix the, the now, because all time, past, present, and future, it's the now, it's, it's the, the frequency and expression, of, again, the frequency war, right? Uh, but in between lives, what we do is we map out our incarnations. We map them out. And what I've noticed, too, is certainly it's not the case with all, but with, certainly with some, that, that some of these my lab women, abductee women, spiritual warriors, every one of them, heart-centered, every single one of them, They've endured a lot of trauma, not only in this life, but in some of their past lives. Inquisition, witch burnings, I mean, the lot. I mean, it, it, here's why. Because these archontic beings know who we are before we know who ourselves are. They know, they know the, our energetic signature, our DNA, they know who we are, right? And so what they do is, by sticking like these archontic controlled people in our family unit or you know, having these friends of the family who were child molesters nearby, whatever the case may be, they want to knock us off course and turn us into wounded, shame-based individuals who lack self-worth, who are in a perpetual OCD thought loop of despair, misery, hopelessness, and they reinforce that with all the rage frequencies, hate frequencies, beaming, the media, uh, and the fear porn that's, that's pumped out. It, it takes a strong person to overcome this. And I, I'm glad to say I'm seeing more and more uh, people come in, coming into their own. Now, what's, what's key is I've never been like a group follower, right? I've always said I'd rather, rather run with one than be dragged out in my 20. Because when you're in a large group, it's so easy to manipulate so many people. I talked about the battleground of the alien abduction support group meeting, I mean, in some of my other talks. But that's what happens. I start talking about this stuff. Someone gets triggered. One time, I was talking. I was in a group of people who were alien abduction researchers and hypnotic therapists, hypno, hypnotist therapists, who were all well versed in alien abductions. And I started talking about reptilians. This was the meeting after the meeting, which was always more productive and interesting. We were in like a diner somewhere, and I started talking about reptilians. In the corner of my eye, one of the female alien abduction researchers started spasmodically twitching spontaneously and uncontrollably. And then I looked over at Eve Lorgan and she kind of gave each other that look. My point is, goddess bless her, okay? Someone who is triggered to that extent where they begin spazzing out uncontrollably is hardly qualified to hypnotically regress and counsel people who are alien abductees because what will happen is the entities working through them will embed hypnotic commands, programming, et cetera, et cetera, in the, the, the hypnotic work. And so then you have whole swarms of people who come to her for help or him, and they just get more destabilized, more fragmented, more messed up. But what happens is 
amidst that group, a spiritual warrior is able to detach and break free. So what, what I see is encouraging is the cells are developing. Cells of individuals that work singly or in small groups, and because of the internet, we can network with like minds around the globe, right? And, and because of our metaphysical abilities, we can work in the inner planes, we can do remote viewing with each other, we can go on Skype and do, do, and there's a lot of healing that's going on. This is important. I wish I had time to talk about this. It's not only healing one another, one another. I've been talking to uh, healers around the world and I've taken part in, in group healings on Skype because I tend to know people who are world-class mystic shaman seers, remote viewers, the lot, okay? Those are the kinds of people that I, I resonate with. And what we've noticed is that different beings are coming to us for healing. See, it, it's, there's beings behind beings behind beings. The, the snake beings actually are, are more controlled than the reptilians, but the snake entities do. These are interdimensional snake entities that embed themselves energetically into people. The solar plexus is a very common place because that's where our spiritual will, spiritual intelligence center is, etc. And then we get all blocked up. I'm one of those people, I do believe that the chakra system is a control system because a fully realized spiritual being shouldn't have to have chakras. But un unlike, you know, it's a trendy, chic thing these days to turn off one chakras. I, I wouldn't go that far. It, it, my attitude is it, it's what we've got to work with Let's clear out all the blockages. Let's get the meridians flowing, right? And so what these snake entities do is they, they embed themselves uh, in other beings, often in the solar plexus area. Well, more and more uh, entities have been coming to healers and, say, and are saying, please get this snake entity out of me, right? I was with a group of people that I, gen I generically refer to them as the Germans, right? And I, we used to have these Skype uh, healing sessions, whatever kind of challenge an individual uh, in our group is going through, or if we knew, had another friend who was not part of our group, but we can remotely heal that person. What happened was this reptilian kept showing up in our weekly sessions. And after about three weeks, uh, the, the German gal, uh, they were all Germans except me, uh, she, he, she said, well, he's back again, and I don't, I'm going to ask him this time what he wants, right? Because she intuited that he was basically harmless. But after about the third session when he showed up, she asked, what can we do for you? And he said, can you please take the snake entity out of me, right? So we did. We took it out, and then it went on. It left. The next week in our Skype session, several more reptilians showed up. And they also, likewise, asked to have the snake entities removed. And then, a week after that, get this. A bunch of dragons showed up. Dragons are real, folks. Dragons are interdimensional earth beings. They were native to this plane. What happened was, ages ago, the, the, the Dracos invaded, and, they, and, and snake entities were embedded in the physical dragons and they were compelled to do things they didn't want to do like my labs are compelled to do things they don't want to do what happened was humans began to hunt the physical uh, dragons which lacked interdimensional capability basically hunted them to extinction right i have friends in this room that have seen dragons i've seen dragons okay they're real the ones that had interdimensional capability escaped now the ones that came to us because you know um I'll just call her uh, Natasha, the, the German gal, who's our, our, basically our leader because she was the best. Uh, she can see in the multiple planes. She can see if there was uh, where I'm at in the Skype session, Skype session, if there's a, like a mantis being next to me, if there's some other being as a friendly ET around me. Well, the dragons approached. And long story short, we extracted the snake entities out of several dragons. They all started. And, and, Natasha could see all this in her psychic third eye. She can see in the different planes, different dimensions, as could several of the others in the Skype session. And the dragons began doing cartwheels. They began flying around in all these different patterns. They were delighted because they were no longer slaves. They were no longer slaves. They can go on and continue their spiritual journey, which was like hijacked, basically, by the snake entities. So healing is a big part of it. So. Those of you that are healers, if you are confronted by some negative, what appears to be 
a negative low vibrational energy, just keep in mind it may want a healing also. So I don't know how much time we have, but. We're basically out of time. Please give a big hand to James. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you.